You've probably heard of invasive species. Invasive species, or introduced species, are species that move or spread to a location where they're not native. Some invasive species spread due to natural phenomenon. But today, most are dispersed by human activities that transport individuals from one location to another. Many of these invasive species are pests. They adversely affect environments, human economy, and human health. The invaders disrupt and dominate their new homes because nothing is there that is capable of stopping them. Once a species successfully invades a place, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to remove it. There are many examples of invasive species. Two of the most common pests in the United States are the emerald ash borer and Asian carp. The emerald ash borer is a green beetle native to northeastern Asia. It was first observed in North America in Canton, Michigan in 2002, but may have been brought to the U.S. as far back as the 1980s in shipping materials and packing crates. Female borers lay their eggs in bark crevices, cracks, and flakes on ash trees. When the eggs hatch about two weeks later, they release larvae that chew on the bark and burrow into the tree so they can feed on materials in the wood. As the borers feed, they leave trails behind them. Over time, these trails develop into large galleries. When the borers ultimately reach maturity, the beetles chew exit holes and depart the trees. But the trees themselves may never recover. After the trees in an area become infested by emerald ash borers, they typically die within a span of 10 years without human control measures put in place. Asian carp are also native to Asia, but unlike emerald ash borers, they are aquatic invaders. They are considered nuisance fish or pest fish. Asian carp were probably brought to North America in the 1970s for use in aquaculture ponds. Although people in North America do not widely eat Asian carp, fish farmers in the southern U.S. states began importing the fish in the 1970s to help clean their commercial fishing ponds. At some point, these fish found their way into the Mississippi River. This probably happened when there was flooding and the commercial ponds overflowed into the river. Alternatively, the release may have been accidental. In any case, the fish used the Mississippi River like a super highway. From there, they spread to many of the rivers and streams throughout the U.S. Along the way, they cause many indigenous fish populations to decline in size. Of course, what does invasive really mean anyway? Humans originated in Africa sometime between 200 and 300,000 years ago. Early humans left Africa sometime between 50 and 70,000 years ago and spread across the globe. Today, humans inhabit every landmass on the planet, even Antarctica, to an extent. One could argue, then, that humans are the ultimate invasive species. But what is a species, anyway? I'm sure you've heard the word before, many times. It comes up a lot. But what does it mean? How do you define it?
and how do you actually recognize a species? Let's start with the obvious. You can have a species of almost anything. Obviously, there are species of organisms. But have you ever heard of species of currency? There are also species of minerals. In general terms, then, a species is simply a kind of a sort of thing, whether it be a sort of currency, a mineral, or organism. The more important question is, how do you distinguish one sort of thing from another? In the earth and life sciences, there are a number of different approaches one could take to identify a species. Some approaches are better than others. It really depends on the situation. Ask a biologist, and they will probably tell you that two individuals belong to the same species if they could potentially breed and produce viable, fertile offspring. We call this approach the biological species concept. According to this approach, the appearance of an individual doesn't matter. Organisms are considered to be species if they actually or potentially breed with each other in nature and don't interbreed with individuals of other species. In other words, species are reproductively isolated from each other. It is important to note that the offspring produced by a species must be viable and fertile. Viable means that the offspring must be healthy enough to survive, mature, and grow to adulthood. And fertile means that the offspring must be able to breed with other members of the species and sire children of their own. It's hard to fathom at times, but there are actually species that can successfully breed with each other and produce offspring that are neither viable nor fertile. Horses and donkeys are the classic example. They are considered two different species. However, if you cross a female horse or mare with a male donkey, called the jack, you get a mule. Mules are viable animals. Farmers like them because they are larger, more intelligent, and more agreeable than donkeys, and they are generally more patient and live longer than horses. However, the vast majority of mules are infertile so they can't produce offspring of their own with horses, donkeys, or other mules. According to the biological species concept, mules aren't species. They are a hybrid, that is, an offspring produced by the breeding of individuals belonging to two different species. There are other examples of hybrids too. Ligers are hybrids of lions and tigers. Zonkeys are hybrids of zebra and donkeys. Jaglions are crosses of jaguars and lions. And beefalo or cattalo are hybrids of bison and cattle like cows and bulls. Overall, the biological species concept is popular among life scientists. But if you ask a paleontologist how they would identify a species, they would give you a different answer. Consider this. If you found two fossils, how would you know that they could potentially reproduce with each other, let alone produce healthy, viable, and fertile offspring? Could you know? The answer is no. 
You could not tell, simply by looking at two fossils, whether the organisms that produced them could ever reproduce. Instead, paleontologists rely on an approach called the morphological species concept. According to the morphological species concept, species can be distinguished from each other by their appearance or morphology. The morphology of an organism is its form, shape, and size. All members of a species will have the same form, shape, and size following the morphological species concept. To assist in the recognition of species, paleontologists often collect measurements of fossils' shape and size, and then conduct comprehensive analyses looking for fossils with similar sets of measurements. We refer to the study of form, shape, and size as morphometrics. The morphologies of some organisms are complex. It takes a lot of time and training to recognize all of the characteristics of a trilobite and to distinguish one species from another. Of course, being able to recognize one or even many species is only so useful. We can't know the exact number of species on Earth. There are too many to count. But scientists have already identified over 1.4 million species, and some researchers estimate that there could be anywhere between 3 and 30 million species of plants, animals, fungi, protists, and prokaryotes on Earth. Of these species, nearly half of them may be insects. So far, Paleontologists have discovered more than 250,000 species in the fossil record, but the number keeps growing every year. To really make sense of all of these species, we need a system for organizing them into groups. Taxonomy is the science of defining, naming, and classifying groups of organisms based on their shared characteristics, like their morphology. Here, you can see the taxonomy of the species Ursus arctos, brown bears. Brown bears share many characteristics with other animals that allow us to identify groups of similar organisms, genera, families, orders, classes, and so forth. We call these groups taxa. Each individual taxon has certain defining characteristics. In earth and life science, we typically use a system of classification based on Linnaean taxonomy. Linnaean taxonomy was first developed and applied by a Swedish botanist, zoologist, and physician named Carl von Linné. Like many other scholars and academics who lived in the 18th century, Linné published many of his writings in Latin, and so he frequently rendered his name as Carolus Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus, as he is most commonly known today, is widely considered to be the father of modern taxonomy. In 1735, he published a landmark book entitled Systema Naturae, which translated from Latin means a general system of nature. Over time, he published additional editions of this seminal work. His 10th edition, published in 1758, marked the start of zoological nomenclature, the start of naming of animals. In 1753, he published an additional seminal work called Species Plantarum. This book listed every species of plant known at the time and is now recognized as the starting point for botanical no nomenclature, 
the naming of plants. It is fair to say that scientists still benefit greatly from Linnaeus's work on naming plants and animals. Through his work, Linnaeus developed and applied a revolutionary new system for classifying organisms, which we now call Linnaean taxonomy. Since the time of Linnaeus, scholars have continued to improve and revise his system of classification. Today, organizations like the International Commissions of Zoological and Botanical Nomenclature establish, set, and revise the standards for naming plant and animal species. They publish these standards of naming and classifying species in books, like these international codes of nomenclature. These standards are, in essence, rules that scientists must follow whenever they do taxonomic work. These are rules that scientists must follow whenever they name a species. So what does Linnaean taxonomy actually look like? How do you do it? Linnaean taxonomy is a hierarchical system. Species are the basic unit, and they are repeatedly grouped into larger and more inclusive taxa. Species are combined into genera. Genera are combined into families. Families are combined into orders, and so forth. The largest, most inclusive groups are domains. These are the three main branches on the tree of life. Domains are made up of kingdoms. There are six kingdoms. The archaea bacteria and eubacteria each correspond to one of the domains. The other four kingdoms, animalia, plantae, fungi, and protista, all belong to the domain Eukarya. Kingdoms, in turn, consist of phyla, which are too numerous to review here. The animal kingdom alone includes over 35 phyla. Because Linnaean taxonomy is hierarchical, there are more low-ranking taxa than high-ranking taxa. Case in point, there are millions of species on Earth today, but only three domains of life. Likewise, there are hundreds of thousands of species of plants, but only one plant kingdom. Many students find acronyms helpful in learning and remembering the various ranks in Linnaean taxonomy. My preferred acronym was always, Dear King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Domain, Kingdom, Phylum, Class, Order, Family, Genus, Species. One other important aspect of Linnaean taxonomy is how species get their names. Each species has one and only one scientific name, in addition to one or more common names. You heard scientific names of species before, I'm sure of it. Tyrannosaurus rex, Homo sapiens. Again, there are specific rules that scientists must follow when they give species names. The names are written in Latin and must be unique. No other species can have the same name. And the name should ideally be meaningful and appropriate to the organism. The direct translation of Tyrannosaurus rex is Tyrannical Lizard King, which if you ask me is pretty appropriate. The name of our species, Homo sapiens, was first proposed by Carl Linnaeus in 1758. It means wise man, which I guess may or may not be all that appropriate, depending on who you ask. As you probably noticed, species names follow binomial nomenclature. In binomial nomenclature, the scientific name of a species consists of two parts.
The first part is the name of its genus. The second is a trivial name which specifies the species. When you identify a species by name, you need to provide both parts. The name of our species is Homo sapiens, not sapiens. And whenever the name is written out in text form, the text should be italicized. Our species, Homo sapiens, belongs to the genus Homo. Homo belongs to the family called Hominidae, along with other genera like Australopithecus. The hominids belong to the order primates, along with other apes. Primates belongs to mammals. Mammals belong to chordates, and chordates belong to the animal kingdom. After scientists find, name, and classify a species, the final step in taxonomy is writing and publishing a paper that reports and describes the discovery. The purpose of this publication is to disseminate the knowledge to the world at large. All this work on classifying species can seem overwhelming at times, but consider the alternative. There are too many taxa, living and extinct on our planet, to learn every species. Taxonomy simplifies the problem. To be a historical geologist, you don't need to memorize the name of every species. Just the names of the most important domains, kingdoms, and phyla.